good evening to our chair speakers and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. We are back again with yet another edition of webinars with two very interesting topics for you. The first speaker for today is our very honored guest and who is a very distinguished faculty from Chile, Professor Leonidas Quintana. Professor Quintana is the honorary president, WFNS, honorary president of the Flank, headline professor of neurosurgery at the Valparaiso University School of Medicine, Valparaiso, Chile. He was a past president of the Chilean Neurosurgery Society. He has received several medals of honors for his outstanding contribution towards neurosurgical education, including the Lifetime Achievement Award of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. He is a noted author with several publications in various peer-reviewed journals, and he also serves on the editorial board of several reputed neurosurgery journals. His specialty of interest includes cerebral surgery, brain tumors, and neurotrauma. We are extremely honored to have him today with us to be a speaker at our webinars, and he'll be talking about management of intracranial dis dissections, blood blisters like aneurysms. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from Japan, Professor Kosaku Amano. Professor Amano is a junior associate professor, Department of Neurosurgery at the Tokyo Women's Medical University. His subspecialty of interests are brain tumor surgery, endoscopic pituitary surgery, and skull base surgery. He is a member of the Japanese Society of Neuroendoscopy and Pituitary Tumors. He is a counselor of the Japanese Society of Pituitary Tumors, Neuroendoscopy, and Endocrinology. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars, and today he'll be talking about pituitary surgery, its history, current innovations, and future perspectives. The chair for the first session of today is our distinguished faculty and leading cerebrovascular expert from Shanghai, China, Professor Shubin. Professor Shubin is a senior consultant neurosurgeon at the Huashan Hospital, Fudan University, Shanghai, China. Professor Shubin possesses the largest number of bypass for myomyditis in the world. His specialty also includes AVMs and aneurysms and other vascular anomalies. He is a noted author with several publications in various peer reviewed journals. He is our main mentor in China and has assisted us from the very beginning in running this online lectures just for you. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Quintana. The chair for the second session of today is another stalwart in the field of neuroendoscopy, Professor Luigi Maria Cavallo. Professor Cavallo is the Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at the Federico Second University Hospital in Naples. He has performed more than 1,500 endoscopic endonasal transcranial pituitary surgeries and more than 500 endoscopic endonasal skull base surgeries for different intracranial lesions, including craniopharyngiomas, meningiomas, clavicordomas, and other rare tumors. He is the author of more than 200 publications of neurosurgical interest in various international journals and 32 book chapters. He has also been an invited lecturer in more than 80 occasions in various international courses, meetings, and congresses. We are extremely honored and thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Amano. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the chair speakers and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Boon Singh from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this virtual platform to our first chair, Professor Shubin. So now the, uh, let's welcome the first speaker, Professor Leonidas uh, Quintana uh, from uh, Chile. And uh, Professor Quintana is uh, not only a very skillful neurosurgeon, but also a very good researcher. Uh, I read a lot of his papers. And uh, let's welcome Professor Quintana. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished colleagues. Especially uh, Professor Dr. Joko Kato, Professor Dr. Rai Christian Kuti, and our chair, Professor Dr. Chu Bing. Uh, <clears throat> for me, it's a pleasure to give uh, this lecture, uh, especially for the Asian Congress of Neurological Surgeons. Uh, I must, okay. <clears throat> The scorcher, the author has no relevant definition of financial involvement. So uh, I want, first of all, excuse me, but I want to thank uh, where I learned a, lo a lot of my uh, knowledge. More than 40 years ago, I did my uh, fellow under Professor Jiro Suzuki uh, at Sendai, Japan. And I always I want to come back to the Orient, even not only Japan, China, South Korea. So uh, the last time I traveled uh, and could learn more about cerebrovascular disease was in November 
where I gave the Jiro Suzuki Memorial Conference related with the history of Latin American neurosurgery. And always I like too much. The last time I went to the Orient was in September 2019 at Beijing, the Interim World Congress. Wonderful time, really. So um, thank you very much for giving that teaching. Uh, and uh, now I will begin uh, this uh, lecture. A special uh, consideration first related to blood blister ligonorism, in this part mainly dedicated to residents. As introduction, I want to uh, mention that uh, uh, the arterial dissection, the blood blister like is an arterial dissection, intraclinal arterial dissection. It's caused by the entry of blood into the arterial wall, inside the wall, uh, with formation of intramural hematoma, small hematoma that uh, spread, progress the parietal layers, the different parietal layers. And maybe located this dissection under the intima, as you can see, usually giving some ischemic symptoms, that is the rule. But uh, if the dissection progress, the outer layers, uh, mainly located uh, between the media and the adventitia. This is subadventitial dissection. This is the blood blister like anoris because uh, uh, if progress, it may be extravasation of blood to intracranial level. So a uh, blood blister like, like this, may trigger, of course, a subadventitial hemorrhage. About the etiopathogeny, uh, two main causes are, uh, one is a carried injury of the arterial wall that weakened the arterial wall. So we may, uh, patient with systemic hypertension that produce lipolyalinosis and may uh, weak the arterial wall. And the second is a hypercholesterolemia with a uh, Alternatives ulcer that also may weaken the arterial wall. Uh, the second cause most frequently is hypodynamic stress of cerebral flow over area with structural dysfunction of uh, collagen, usually related with a uh, Marfan disease or earlier Dudlow disease or imperfect osteogenesis or. Uh, uh, um, some problems with the structural uh, configuration of the collagen, that is uh, the second cause. I may give this kind of the section that really is not aneurysm. We call blister like aneurysm because it's a form what we see in the angiography, but this really is a dissection. About the topography and the frequency. Uh, the most frequent uh, uh, location in the blood blister like, especially is the uh, superior wall or external carotid artery, in, especially the ophthalmic segment. I have seen also in the M1 segment and also in the A1 segment of the anterior cerebral artery. And uh, in the posterior circulation, I have seen more frequently in the vertebral artery, B4 segment, sometimes very near the pike. Uh, that's the more, of course, this, the, the dissection may happen also in the uh, cervical artery, of course, but it's, it's not my topic in this moment. I will uh, talk about the intracranial dissections. And about the frequency, if we revise uh, this uh, report by Professor Jiro Suzuki and Hara, usually uh, the epidemiology uh, shows about one to 2% of 
the all intracranial arteries. It's not so frequent, but it's a severe disease. About the clinical imagological picture, if the dissection is producing the vertebral artery, we can see in the left side, uh, suenoid hemorrhage, especially in the posterior fossa, as you can see here. But if the dissection is uh, in the supratentrial region, I mean, mainly in internal carotid artery or M1 or A1, the figure is uh, uh, usually a paracellar suenoid hemorrhage, or sometimes more extended. I have seen in the sometimes uh, the dorsal dissection of the internal carotid artery may produce sometimes uh, intracerebral frontal uh, 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 intracerebral uh, frontal uh, hemorrhage. Usually in the, when the dissection is located in the dorsal part of the ophthalmic segment of the carotid artery. Uh, this is the most important point, the uh, intracranial arterial dissection, the so-called blood blister, like the classical is that this uh, figure is located in the path, in the path of the main artery. That is different from uh, very aneurysm that that's all of us know very well that is produced in the bifurcation of the artery. This is in the path of the artery. Here in the left, the internal carotid artery dissection, and on the right, the usual location, the vertebral artery. Now we enter about the uh, my surgical te technique. Uh, I, I'm a neurosurgeon, but of course I will say some words related with the, uh, the treatment, uh, the endov endovascular treatment. But first, we I want to mention the clipping, the surgical technique, direct clipping, wrapping and clipping, plus trapping, plus or not using bypass, and the angioplasty. And it, that is uh, really an is more rough. Well, about clipping, I learned when I was in Japan, 1980, Professor Jiro Suzuki was very close friend of Professor Kenichi Sugita. And he teach me that uh, how to treat this kind of pathology. He said, usually if we, in this uh, figure, we have the optic uh, nerve, the internal carotid artery, and in the dorsal portion of the ophthalmic segment, is a usual location of the uh, dissection, which is a blood blister like. If uh, we decide to operate, or if we uh, find we enter operated anoris, but we find this uh, location, please use a late surgery not early surgery, because late surgery <laughs> may be so complicated uh, surgery. If we enter and uh, see the uh, aneurysm, use light clip, not so big or uh, uh, heavy clip, a, l a light clip, like this mini clip usually following the direction of the artery, I mean the flow, not in cross, but following the direction of the flow. And if possible, include the edge of the colored aneurysm, the edge of the uh, dissection, include the borders of the main artery. That may be the best. I, I will show some photographies. This is a report in the Chilean Journal of Neurosurgery, and also in Brazil, this uh, book of uh, Professor uh, Pires de Guiar. This is the blood blister-like anorexia. You can see internal carotid, left internal carotid artery, 
I did a small retraction for to show clearly. And you can see A1 left A1 and the dissection is this, it's a classical figure. So I used a light clip, not a very heavy clip, following the direction of the artery and including a part, not of, of course, not of the artery, a part of the edge of the uh, neck. That was uh, sufficient. Uh, here uh, I have another uh, uh, case with the dorsum of right internal carotid artery. This is the angio. And uh, you can see here uh, optic uh, nerve. I'm dissecting the sister. I see the aneurysm he is here. But can you see this? The rest of the <laughs> arterial wall. This was a dissection. So I put the clip here. It should be like a neck, but it's a dissection. It's not really an aneurysm. I put in the clip. And clean aspiration. And I want to see what happened with this portion. It's very rare. The section continues here. So I coagulate. If the really the clip is complete, it's not complete. It's not complete. What can we do now? I decided to put the clip in tandem. Why? Many colleagues say, why people put so small? Honoris, you put the clip in tandem. Because I thought at that time when I was operating this honoris, if I take both, take off this clip, I will broke more the arterial dissection. So it was, uh, uh, I finally decided to put two clips, mini clips, two mini clips in tandem. And uh, the bleeding stop. After that, uh, well, it's following the video, uh, I, I did a fenestration of lamina terminalis. Usually I, I, I do this, uh, especially an ACOM aneurysm and uh, clean and aspirate. I, I learned, of course, in Japan, this uh, Professor Jiro Susuke sometimes they did a, a very wide approach, bifrontal approach. But uh, I, I thought that was enough a frontoterrional, right frontoterrenal approach. And uh, did a uh, fenestration of lamina terminalis and put always a cisternal drainage for to prevent the uh, cerebral vasus pass. Okay. Second, I learned from Akira Ogawa. Nishida Suzuki, Kuroki Ogasawa, the group of uh, Sendai, my uh, remember <laughs> uh, Sendai group, Akira Ogawa. Uh, look at the, he, he published 2000, but I met Akira Ogawa and the uh, World Congress of uh, Marrakesh, 2005. And he showed this uh, report. Uh, this photography is not uh, of uh, Professor Ogawa, but the, the, the idea is to, if, if I find this kind of morphology, morphology uh, can't you see this uh, like a teromatose? So if I put a clip here, of course I will broke because it, this is not a real berry aneurysm. There is no real neck here. So uh, he teach me that uh, he put the Teflon is a silk derivative around wrapping and clip over the material, the silk material for not to broke the arterial dissection, not to broke. So I have just by the time 
uh, this kind, this second uh, technique, dropping. Uh, sometimes this, uh, my case, uh, left M1, a trif trifurcation, M2, M2, and M2. After that, I clean, I took off uh, uh, the clothes and I found that the section was this. It's a fibrin, spontaneous fibrin coagulation. Uh, of course, I didn't aspirate this and put uh, also wrapping, but with muscle, muscle with using muscle of the patient. And over the muscle, I put a clip only to repair and contain the dissection, contain the dissection. Usually now I'm using uh, uh, fibrin adhesive also. I put fibrin adhesive and use muscle around, surrounding the dissection. And the clip is for contain the, the, the mask. Also, this has been published in the Holland Surgery most, more recently by Professor Nishi Kai Koga Yamashiro Mizuno Basaki. Uh, this was a, another case. Uh, when I was the angiotomography, oh, I said that it's a super hypophysial aneurysm. Fine, I will keep an enter to less uh, frontoterional approach, clip the aneurysm, but can you see? This was a dissection. So very rare appearance, but this was a dissection. So uh, after I uh, could see under the optic nerve and put the wrapping up, but in this case, I use fibrin adhesive over this and put muscle here. As in this photography show, uh, the clip, but I put uh, only muscle, fibrin adhesive and muscle. And uh, the patient, uh, uh, the evolution of the patient was very good. Uh, this is a special technique by, described by Professor Park from South Korea. I think this is original of uh, Dr. Park, this photography. Uh, well, I, I can see he showed his photographies and use uh, this technique, this technique for to maintain, maintain the blood flow during the micro sutures. But it's very difficult, very difficult. I have done only one time because if uh, this wall, I can see is yellow, yellow color. So I think it's maybe a teroma. And if I put the point the suture over that teroma, I may, I may provoke a disaster. But he did very well and did a suture over the rupture here and succeed. But in my hands, I think this may be very, very difficult. If I find that the uh, arterial wall is in this aspect, more normal, perhaps I, I decide to do this technique, but it's a very difficult technique, I think. So usually I use, uh, if I, 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 I cannot do direct clipping, I do wrapping or trapping like this. This is a V4 segment, fortunately uh, far from the PICA emergence. This was created by Professor Jonekawa, and this picture uh, figure is uh, his uh, technique. You can see here the emergence of pica. He did the uh, trapping. And if I have a good collateral circulation from the other side, 
no problem. I can do trapping. Uh, this was the case. I did trapping, trapping. So uh, sometimes uh, I've joined uh, that sometimes I use surgery, but usually I discuss with my endovascular. It's another case, it's a, a man, a young man, but uh, with tobacco, he uh, uh, used tobacco and uh, was hypertensive and uh, suffer dissection, uh, severe uh, uh, headache, and posterior circulation, certainly the hemorrhage. And we found he had this other also in the path of the vertebral artery. So we discussed, I, he I, I can, uh, he did the test and uh, he had a very good collateral circulation. And uh, the vascular said, I can, I can, I can coil this and uh, uh, made it obstruction of the vertebral, the older arterial, vertebral artery. And he did. The emergence of pica was very low, so no problem. And he put the coils. Well, I, I think this kind of uh, pathology, we always must discuss because sometimes it's in favor of surgery and other times it's uh, in favor of endovascular treatment. In this case, he stayed in the vascular and uh, the, there was no recurrence because he uh, obstructed all the vertebral artery. But in other case, I remember uh, in the World Federation of 2007 at Nagoya, I could uh, hear this lecture of Byung-Li He Lee from South Korea, uh, a wonderful experience. Uh, he showed what happens sometimes. He did a coiling of the dorsal uh, blood blister like, as you can see here, but in the control angiography two months later, the aneurysm wrote. So he, he was very skillful and uh, use the, the technique of st stent between the stent, that is a throw diverter stent inside the other stent and resolve the problem. Later, uh, in 2009, he published his excellent experience in the Journal of Neurosurgery. The same experience was uh, published later by Professor Rosenbasser from Boston exactly the same experience. So in this moment, if they, the comment, if can perform at the first time, flow diverter, they put the stent flow diverter. So case by case, <laughs> I think we always must cast in team with our endoscope, what is best for the patient. Well, I will summarize uh, our experience in about, uh, about 20 years. We have uh, treated 21 cases of blood pressure like. Uh, we have operated uh, 1,071 arteries. About 2% are blood pressure like arteries. At the location, you can see on the left, usually internal carotid artery 9. A13, M12, vertebral 7. Usually, uh, the patients are in severe conditions. As you can see in the World Federation scale, uh, 11 case in World Federation 3 and 6 case in World Federation 4. So 17 were in uh, big MRH. Uh, in the modified fish scale, that is Columbia scale, 19 were 
feature scale modified, modified feature scale three and five case in four. So severe hemorrhage is a severe disease. And the treatment you can see type was endovascular therapy, eight clipping, three trapping and one wrapping. And uh, how about the results? Not so good. Modified radical scale, good results. I mean, modified radical scale one or two, as you can see, only 11 cases. So 52.4%, half and half almost, half and half good, half and half bad. Three patients died. So in summary, I think uh, the treatment of blood vessel like is associated with a high morbidity uh, rate. Uh, this comment I could uh, read from Professor Juha Hernandevi. At the time he was in Finland. I think now he's in China working very well. And he's a very respected professor. I follow him. Uh, he commented usually, and he has a reason, this is a small size aneurysm. Sometimes we, we enter to operate an aneurysm, like in this opportunity I show, uh, I will clip this uh, super epiphyseal artery, but was the dissecting aneurysm. Uh, so sometimes we can't, uh, we may, we must perform emergency decisions. Not always uh, we may uh, uh, program the surgery. Uh, there is a very high risk of intraoperative aneurysm rupture due to fragility of the main artery and the aneurysm ball. And if I have the time and I, 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 I may program my surgery, uh, I can do, for example, in trapping. Uh, intentionally, I lost the parent entry. But in that case, if I have good collateral circulation or problem, but I must be prepared to, be, to, to, to make a bypass surgery if necessary. Because sometimes uh, the decision is uh, uh, like an emergency surgery. So in general, I have compared my experience with the experience of uh, uh, notable uh, neurosurgeons. And usually, nobody shows excellent results. Usually, the result is not so good. That is uh, true. Uh, so, uh, I think, in summary, usually, it, this uh, aneurysms are uh, found in the path of the artery. Well, we must see like a form we call blood blister like, but really that aneurysm is a dissection. So with a diseased wall artery, keep in mind. And I show in summary, I think uh, the most frequent surgical treatment, but also endovascular. Always we must discuss uh, this pathology with our Well, thank you very much for hearing this uh, uh, conference. And uh, I hope uh, you are important comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Quintana. So, Thank you for your uh, very informative uh, presentation. And uh, I also learned a lot from your presentation. Uh, you listed all the uh, possible treatment for the uh, Bristol-like uh, aneurysm. Actually, we also have some experience uh, which also treated a different way like you described. Uh, my prefer one is uh, if it's possible, we 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 will use uh, covered stent because it's more 
uh, reliable. Because <laughs> yeah. the open surgery sometimes it's very difficult to because you have uh, just as you mentioned it's a dissection, so you don't know how much uh, exactly the field uh, was uh, in danger of the war. So sometimes it's uh, have to be uh, to have to do the bypass to sacrifice yeah. the parent artery. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You. I Thank enjoy you. your presentation very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. As Professor Shubin said, that fragility of this very dangerous blood blisters like aneurysms cannot be overemphasized. They may rupture, causing torrential bleed intraoperatively, and hence many surgeons prefer upfront bypass, as uh, Professor Mustafa Baskaya's case, where 50% had a uh, means out of four, one patient died, but three had a good outcome. So what is your uh, concept about not touching the aneurysm and directly doing an upfront bypass? Professor Quintana? Yes, what I you? agree. What said uh, Professor Chubin, I know he has a lot of experience and uh, I agree with him. Uh, as I said, I mentioned, uh, we shall, usually we discuss with the endoscular, and uh, he mentioned also, Professor Chubin, that um, uh, the throat diverter stents are more reliable for to treat this kind of disease. Uh, I have some uh, surgical experience, but uh, with advance of the experience in our institute, usually we are in favor of the for the endovascular treatment. That is uh, true. My course, Dr. Lubun Singh. Thank you, thank you, Raja. Uh, prof, uh, I, I want to ask from you, Prof, uh, regarding some technique of a uh, wrapping. Uh, do you think that the angiography intraoperatively, like uh, ICG? Uh, we help help us to know whether it's fully uh, obliterated or not. Second thing that uh, what is your opinion regarding uh, uh, blister due to an infection cause? Do you think that they will heal better uh, in your experience? Thank you, Professor. Secretary, you may kindly answer that question. I ask. Uh, excuse me, but. Uh, uh, of course, uh, ICG is an excellent uh, 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 control for the immediate. Uh, now, if the, uh, for instance, if I do uh, uh, clipping, I must do ICG. I didn't uh, show this case because I, uh, but actually, uh, all of us in our uh, uh, institute and uh, we use ICG, of course. But the second question, I don't know. Uh, I I I, don't, I didn't understand. Excuse me. The second question of the second question is: uh, Do you encounter any of the cases are uh, due to an infective cause? Uh, whether they they will heal better in those cases? Infective infection. Yeah. No, I didn't. Uh, fortunately, I didn't experience uh, infective. But, uh, you, the question is related if I have uh, an analysis related with the inf general systemic infection. Yes, like a my mycotic uh, analysis. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Sir. Yeah, no, I, in this experience I show it uh, was not effective. I have, of course, some case of uh, mycotic uh, analysis. Uh, uh, usually treated with uh, antibiotic, as you know well, <laughs> first and uh, later, uh, not so frequent treatment of surgical treatment. But uh, in this uh, theory, doctor, I, I show only the dissecting aneurysm, not the mycotic aneurysm. Thank you. We have a question from the audiences regarding mycotic aneurysms, where Professor Ayman Mayas asks, that he has a young patient with M2, M3 ruptured fusiform mycotic aneurysm. She is alert well with endocarditis. So what yes, are yes. the options? Yes. 
he's, he's asking whether what can we do about intervention from our side as a neurosurgeon? Well, as I mentioned, uh, first of all, uh, uh, you say, right, uh, mycotic analysis is inside the systemic infection, this endocarditis and so on. So the first decision is uh, medical treatment with antibiotic. But if uh, finally there is an evolution and I find a uh, distal mycotic, usually, unfortunately, mycotic anorism is very small. And uh, I have treated some of them, of course, sleeping, but uh, not so frequent, really. I, I don't have so much experience uh, when I treat the mycotic anorism with surgery. Usually, they result with a, a medical treatment. That is true. Professor Kimura, any questions from your side? Thank you, Roger. Uh, thank you, Professor Quintana. I'm Hidehito Kimura. So I have one question for your present, nice presentation. So when I treat a patient with a ruptured blood vessel like aneurysm, in my university, I treat a patient with trapping the, with a high flow bypass, universal high flow bypass. So it's the treatment strategy, as you know, the so safe, no rupture. The, Usually the post-operative goes uneventful. However, the you know the the surgical uh, operation time is long longer than usual yes. than the clipping yeah. than simple clipping than the endovascular treatment as you mentioned in the presentation. So that the, the problem is maybe the an indication for the treatment strategy. Treatment strategy. If I choose the clipping is on mere simple clipping and the simple uh, covered stenting. Reliable, reliable cover the stenting may, may be much more better for the treatment. It's a, if it can be done uh, certainly and uh, completely. So what is the problem is the indication for the treatment. Uh, how do you decide the uh, accurate uh, uh, indication for the, when a patient can be treated by the clipping or endovascular treatment or uh, in some patients maybe it's not to be selected it should be trapped and the high flow biopsy should be made. Do you know some uh, good uh, imaginary, imaginary uh, indication, imaginary ima uh, uh, specific, uh, features for the, for the treatment indication? Pre operative in imaging. Yes. How can we differentiate between the two, these uh, surgical strategies? Oh. Uh, thank you for the question. I must be very honest, uh, Professor Kibora. Uh, the first case I show, uh, really, uh, sometimes I have to decide uh, surgery only alone. The first case, the first case, more than 10 years ago. Uh, recently, uh, preoperatively, case by case, we discussed with the endovascular. I think it's the best. I think it's the way, uh, because uh, I show that I had uh, three catastrophic uh, results, three patients died. And uh, in one opportunity I had to make uh, uh, emergency bypass, but he did failure, uh, I have a failure. So uh, you are, uh, you, you have the reason, I think, usually we must program, if possible, when endoscopy, what is the best decision for the patient? And in recent years, the majority of the case we discuss and go with the endovascular treatment, especially using the flow diverted stents. Uh, but in some case, I show the results were, uh, I show a video where I put clip I put, put, put a clip, a tender clip. Uh, the patient uh, did very well, but uh, I cannot recommend uh, to enter and, uh, you know, uh, to, to perform my surgery as, as much as possible. No, I prefer now to discuss preferably and uh, 
to make the correct decision with the, my endovascular. Now I'm more calm, <laughs> not, yeah, not so aggressive right. with yeah. that surgery. That is yeah. the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can. Uh, Kimura. Yeah. Yes, Professor. Yeah. So you mentioned that you always use the high flow bypass yeah. and the sacrifice the parent artery. Yeah. So yes. uh, actually, uh, do you estimate the collateral from the ACOM and the PCOM before the surgery? So you can make the strategy, uh, tailor the st uh, strategy for the patient because, you know, uh, in my opinion, some Sometimes, if the patient is a male patient, if the uh, STA double, double uh, branch is uh, quite thick and uh, the parent artery is not uh, on the dominant side, mm -hmm. um, mostly uh, the double bypass of STA MCA is enough to uh, replace uh, oh, ICA yeah. blood flow. Yeah. So sometimes it's not necessary to do the high flow bypass. Yeah. Yeah. and. Uh, uh, what kind of uh, graft you use? Uh, the it's a uh, radio artery or saphenous vein. You I mentioned to use the saphenous vein graft. Yes. Okay. Yes. I I prefer to use the first the saphenous vein graft. But some patient has suffered already suffered uh, uh, venous uh, uh, barracks in that in yes, uh, in their lower extremities. So in that patient, I can use the uh, venous graft, but next to, uh, yes, radial artery graft. So yes, as you know, the, the patient usually the emergency come to our hospital. So we can't evaluate the, the blood, several uh, blood flow preoperatively. So, so if possible, we can evaluate the blood circulation in preoperatively uh, adequately. So we can choose the low flow bypass is okay or in mm -hmm. a, a sufficient or not. We can we can select the patient, but I can we can to choose we can to evaluate the blood circulation, especially the patient comatose, and we can evaluate the patient uh, uh, patient consciousness level. So, but so in that case we should we should use the uh, I my strategy is I should we should do or I can do. At in the in the in the mm. time, so so <laughs> you made a, a hyper bypass universal hyper bypass. So actually, yeah, you mentioned the the angiogram uh, indication for for the oh, different yeah. strategic uh, selection. Actually, in my opinion, if the if uh, the uh, Bristol like aneurysm is quite small, and the, the neck was not larger than. Uh, Nine, 90 degree of the vessel wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I prefer to use uh, uh, open surgery to treat it oh, directly. But if good. it's uh, close to the half of the vessel wall, I would choose a uh, uh, covered stent. Covered stent, I see. Yeah, covered stent is not, it's uh, not the uh, uh, same as a uh, fluid diverter. It's uh, yeah. it's have uh, some membrane in the co uh, covered stent. Mm -hmm. It's uh, like okay. a sandwich. Sandwich. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's uh, some membrane to protect the vessel wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The how is there an because uh, the fluid diverter, the metal cover rate is only uh, thirty to forty degree uh, mm -hmm. uh, percent, mm -hmm. but the cover stent is uh, 100 percent. One hundred percent. Yeah. How do you use the antiplatelet drugs postoperatively for the patient? Antiplatelet. Yes, we uh, we use 300, uh, 300 uh, milligram of aspirin and uh, 300 uh, of Previx. I see. So on the, yeah. how is if, the frequency uh, of the post-operative, mm -hmm. how is the frequency of the post-operative rebreeding of the aneurysm, dissection aneurysm? In my personal experience, there's no rebreeding no. after the... Oh. Very excellent. Yes. Yeah. It's just a concern about the post operative rebreeding when the treat mm -hmm. to be treated by the covered stent. Very nice strategy, I think. The, mm -hmm. yeah, I got it. Yes. Next time. Yeah. If you if you choose we the right choose the, size yeah? uh, covered stent, it's quite yeah. safe. Yeah. yeah. But in Japan, maybe it's not to be not to be permitted for use. Just universal use. Uh, 
maybe the commercial use. In emergency case, you yeah. mean not permitted? Yeah. Okay. Usually, it's a, it's uh, a standard manner. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. not a standard technique. Yeah. But next, uh, in the future, it should be maybe as you recommended. Yeah. 100 mm -hmm. covered by the stand. Uh, yeah. The stand is maybe more, much more reliable, much more safer. Yes. Use, use, use it may be, may be easier for use to the uh, emergency case. Much yes. easier. I yes. Guess. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you thank very you. much. We can hear the concluding remarks from Professor Shubin before going okay. back. To okay, thank you, uh, Professor Pantana, again. And uh, today we have uh, uh, around 1,000 audience in, uh, in the Chinese WeChat channel. L let's uh, watch the presentation. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Christian, and thank you for your time and support for the ACNS webinars. We are joined by our honored guest from Italy, Professor Luigi Maria Cavallo. We can go ahead and hear his introduction part. Hello, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Here in Naples, uh, 3.30 p.m. And um, it's uh, always uh, a pleasure for me to attend this, uh, this webinar. And uh, today I have the privilege to introduce uh, Professor Amano, who is uh, Really, an experienced uh, endoscopic skull based surgeon. Um, and uh, he will speak about pituitary surgery from uh, the history uh, to the current innovation uh, with the future perspective. I uh, want just to say a few words about uh, pituitary surgery, which uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, thanks to the endoscope, uh, changed the way to treat uh, uh, not only pituitary tumors, but uh, also different disease uh, uh, growing uh, into the cellar area, and uh, not only. One example uh, is uh, for sure uh, craniopharyngioma, which uh, um, almost everybody accepts today that uh, uh, the endoscopic route uh, offer a great benefit in the management of this tumor, as well as for clival cordomas, but also other skull-based disease, which uh, in the past were treated uh, through anterior transpatial approach, and uh, that today can be managed in a really minimal invasive way, uh, passing simply with the endoscope through uh, the nose. But I'm sure that uh, Professor Amano will uh, cover all the different uh, uh, possibility offered by, by the endoscope. So uh, I will uh, uh, give him the, uh, the, the, the start of the, the presentation. Thank you, Professor Amano, please. Thank you, Dr. Cabarro. Long time, no see you. <laughs> uh, really. <laughs> Okay, so uh, I changed my uh, presentation. Uh, my topic is uh, advancement in pituitary surgery, uh, its history, uh, current innovations, and future perspective uh, for a uh, young neurosurgeon. So first of all, we must think about the historical background of transmural surgery. Uh, in ancient Egypt, Egypt uh, almost 4,000 years ago, they know the route to the brain, beer, uh, nose uh, transformidal, but it's not uh, treatment, uh, just making for their mommy. So uh, they know the route, but it's not uh, useful for the treatment. At the beginning of the uh, 20th century, uh, some uh, otolaryngologist neurosurgeon uh, find the route to the uh, particular region, beer transformidal. Uh, one of them, uh, Schroffer, in uh, 1907. And also neurosurgeon, a uh, very famous uh, Dr. Kusing uh, did this approach. But, you know, Dr. Kusing is so famous doctor. And he said, uh, this operation was so high mortality rate and so many complications. So he said in 1920s, uh, uh, late 1920s, uh, we must abandon this operation and change to open surgery. So uh, because of the uh, complications, uh, this ectop uh, 
wonderful uh, approach is once abundant, out of use. But Dr. Dalt and Dr. Gyo uh, still keep going on this operation. And in 1960s, uh, Dr. Hardy, uh, he's uh, uh, from uh, Canada, Montreal. Uh, you know, Montreal is uh, uh, in Canada, only one uh, state uh, language is French. So he go to French, France, and uh, study uh, neurosurgery uh, and go to the Dr. Guillaume's uh, hospital. And he you know, uh, he ran the transfusion surgery. Uh, he did uh, microscope uh, was introduced to this surgery and also used uh, uh, X-ray during surgery. And this operation become so safe and uh, popular in the world. And this operation survived again. Uh, he is still alive, uh, 2011, uh, which is the neurosurgeon gathered in the Montreal. And there are so many uh, the neurosurgeon uh, come to Montreal, uh, Dr. Kapabianka, uh, Oyesk, and uh, James. And here is uh, uh, Dr. Hardy. Uh, I went to Montreal to take a picture with uh, uh, Dr. Hardy's. So summarize the history. Uh, once this operation uh, out of gone, out of use because of the complications, that Dr. Hardy uh, solved this problem to avoid complication uh, using a, a microscope, and this operation becomes so popular in the world. And in 1990s, uh, endoscope was introduced to this operation, and everybody knows. Uh, now, TSS faced on the new era uh, using endoscope uh, TSS. Uh, in my personal career of TSS, uh, at first, uh, I only experienced uh, only microscope surgery, uh, trans uh, subrabial, uh, subrabial approach, and uh, endoscope assist and change to the uh, transnasal, and gradually. Uh, Converted to the endoscope. And on 2011, uh, I fully converted to the uh, endoscopic surgery. And so far, I experienced more than uh, 1,000 uh, TSS, and uh, including uh, open surgery, uh, more than 1,300. And uh, during this period, I tried to make uh, surgical innovations of TSS. Uh, in instrument, in technique, and complication avoidance. Uh, these instrument, uh, uh, these innovations are related to uh, current endoscopic TSS. Uh, 2011, I converted to the fully uh, uh, endoscopic surgery because uh, this is my revolution, high definition type rigid endoscope. Uh, this has uh, zero degrees, 30 degree, 45, and 70 degrees endoscope, and so many uh, type of the endoscope. Uh, it has uh, seven times higher pixel than uh, conventional type. It can detect the uh, microvascular on the pituitary gland, and the uh, surface of the uh, medial wall of the cavern sinus, there is a arachnoid membrane, and uh, also, uh, flow of RBC we can detect using a high definition type endoscope. It means uh, endoscope uh, was equipped the close up mode in digital camera. Uh, endoscopic TSS, its advantage is panoramic view. Microscope, uh, we can only see this region, but using a endoscope, we can get panoramic view. Furthermore, close-up view is very important in HD endoscope. Using endoscope and the endoscope introduced to close up to the object, we can get such a close-up view. And furthermore, uh, endoscope uh, introduced to the insert into the uh, supercell region, uh, subventricle, we can get 
more close-up view like this. Uh, in microscope, we can get such a, a close-up view. And also conventional type, uh, we cannot get such a uh, very, very uh, close-up close view. I mean, uh, we can not get the in detail of the object. But endoscopic TSS has a disadvantages, uh, narrow and deep corridor, and the endoscope itself becomes an obstacle during surgery. It's mean uh, movement restriction. So we must develop a dedicated instrument for TSS. It's mean an innovation of instrument. Uh, drink. Uh, like this cross for uh, the normal, we must drill out the ICA prominence and reveal uh, the anterior wall of a cavern sinus. At that time, we need a, a dedicated uh, drill and we need a, a so sensitive uh, procedures. And this is a, a irrigation cyst, uh, irrigation suction. Uh, during surgery, uh, blood attached to the tip of the endoscope and uh, like this, a fog becomes. But we want to keep going on the procedures, not to uh, stop the concentration. So assistant clean up the uh, endoscope, we can go on the procedures. Uh, this is irrigation suction and angle irrigation suction. Uh, not open surgery uh, in TSS, uh, assistant cannot pour the saline to the object. So we need such an irrigation suction system. And the instrument for tumor removal, uh, we developed the noble flexible forceps. It can angle the inside of the uh, cell and uh, reach the far lateral superior tumor. It's very useful. And also uh, we developed other instrument for tumor removal, uh, bending ring curate, malleable suction attachment, uh, those are very useful uh, to remove the far lateral tumor. So how about innovation technique? At the tumor removal, we must think about how to preserve surrounding structures and also how to remove superior and lateral extension. And third innovation, uh, complication avoidance. Uh, this complication is uh, very important in TSS, especially CS leakage is very important we established strategy to repair the cell tau care, uh, especially uh, suturing technique and the cell for reconstruction uh, using hard batteries and pedicle flap was very uh, important. Uh, suturing technique, we uh, use this technique since 1998. Uh, purpose is to promote a union of the dura and making attention to the dura. And if we can watertight closure like this, uh, pour the shrine, uh, same as uh, open surgery. And uh, another purpose is the practice. A suturing dura is, uh, uh, why not uh, difficult and uh, troublesome, but uh, uh, you trained this procedure, uh, you can do everything in TSS. Uh, after stitches, uh, make a knot and uh, make a, not tightened is very uh, difficult. So I developed a, a knot tightener. It can easily uh, deliver the knot to the dura. And also uh, this wrong uh, arm is uh, make a roll of the pointing finger and tighten the knot uh, firmly. And cell for reconstruction using a rigid batteries uh, I think uh, originally uh, Sarah 4 was covered with a bone. So I think recovered to the original state. And the septal bone is the uh, uh, best material to the uh, cerebral reconstruction. And the gasket uh, method, uh, Dr. Cabral reported, I think it's an excellent uh, way of make a cerebral reconstruction. And somebody said, uh, we don't need to uh, use a rigid buttress, but I think it's prevent uh, delayed CS leakage. I think it's due to the pressure of CSF pulsations. A pedicle flap, uh, nasal septal flap is so famous. 
most of the institution use this uh, method, but we seldom use it because it is very uh, uh, invasive way. Uh, we routinely use uh, spherosinus mucosal flap. It's just recovered to the original state, peel off the spherosinus mucosa and uh, uh, stay at the original state. So uh, uh, this spherosinus mucosa flap uh, make like this. And uh, the point of this uh, SSM flap is to promote the natural healing process. This mucosa uh, make an important role inside of the spinal sinus. So I uh, recommend this uh, way of using a mucosal flap. Uh, innovation in technique, I told about it, uh, tumor in the tumor removal, how to preserve surrounding structures, how to remove superior neurotrophic extensions. Uh, think about uh, this uh, technique. Uh, how about the, on the functioning uh, pituitary adenoma? Uh, surgical indication for pituitary adenoma, uh, non functioning adenoma, and functioning adenoma were different. Uh, in NFPA, uh, visual impairment is surgical indication uh, to improve visual dysfunctions. And we add the hormonal dysfunction. This is also a surgical indication for non-functioning uh, to improve or preserve pituitary functions. On the other hand, the functioning adenoma, GH, uh, HETH, uh, peroxine, TSH, a hormonal axis is surgical indication uh, to make hormone axis normalized. Uh, so how much tumor should be removed? It's different from non-functioning and functioning. Non-functioning adenoma, 19 to 90, 9%. This means uh, to improve visual impairment, uh, more than 50% is enough to improve visual impairment. But to prevent post-operative uh, intratumor hemorrhage, it sometimes becomes uh, so serious. Uh, at the time, uh, we must remove more than 19%. Uh, uh, but to prevent further hormonal dysfunction, we must remove the tumor less than 99%. On the other hand, functioning adenoma, we must remove uh, 100 to 101%. So uh, pituitary adenoma, non-functioning and uh, function is a different uh, way of removal. So how to remove the tumor 100 to 101%? Uh, we should remove the tumor should capsule a tumor should capsule is originally a uh, uh, pituitary gland, but the compressed by the tumor, it becomes fibrous. And uh, uh, such a fibrous tissue was, uh, is containing the uh, tumor cells. So we must remove uh, such a fibrous tissue, tumor should capsule. And also a tumor with cavernous invasion is a uh, other problem, especially uh, cross grade three and four is uh, difficult to uh, accomplish the total removal. So I show you the representative case. Uh, this is a CNOSP4 uh, GH producing adenoma. Uh, first of all, I remove the tumor inside of the cellar, and uh, this is a 30 degrees in the scope. And uh, this is an intercabinal sinus. Uh, in cavernous sinus, 90 degrees endoscopic view using the angle suction, remove the tumor in the cavernous sinus. And behind the ICA, here's the ICA. Uh, I use the ring crate and remove the tumors. And now I peel off the should capsule from the normal ground. And this is a final view. Normal ground is here. And the tumor is totally removed. After the operation, uh, cortical consensus was created and no GH deficiency after the operation. Next case is a CONOSP2 or 3 uh, case, GH Omer. It looks easy, but uh, uh, in fact, more difficult than previous case. Because uh, in this case, medial wall of the cavernous sinus was still here. So 
Uh, we try to remove the cavernous sinus wall and also remove the tumor. And uh, there is so much venous bleeding because the uh, cavernous sinus was still survived. So uh, we prepared uh, such a uh, packing material. And here is ICA and packing uh, such a materials immediately. And keep going on the uh, medial wall of cavernous sinus removal with tumor. This is all uh, 70 degrees endoscopic view. After the operation, in this case also, uh, cochlear consensus was created, no, and no GH deficiency. So such a uh, innovation in instrument and uh, technique and uh, proficiency in endoscopic manipulation and improvement of management forces leakage uh, helped the result. Uh, GHOMA cortical consensus improved gradually like this. And especially uh, cross grade three and four, uh, after the HD endoscope introduction, uh, it's significantly uh, improved like this. So non-functioning adenoma, uh, this is the eight years old apoplexy case. Uh, he demonstrated visual disturbance, right hemiparesis, conscious deterioration, but he has old and uh, had a heart disease. So anesthesiologist uh, said that uh, uh, you must finish the operation within the two or three hours. So tumor packed south ventricle, maybe 10 years ago, I tried to uh, remove beer into hemisphere approach, but uh, uh, this uh, case, we must remove the tumor beer TSS within the two or three hours. So uh, this is after removal of the uh, intracellular region, 45 degrees endoscope view, and look upward to the uh, south ventricle. This is a apoplexy case, so uh, tumor become fibrous, and uh, here is a uh, hematoma in the tumor, and fortunately uh, uh, grasp the edge of the tumor, uh, tumor removed as uh, embroked. And here we can see the inside of the side ventricle from a mongo and perforated from MCAs and totally removed. But uh, such a huge tumor and with a multi type, it's a uh, most difficult case in the pituitary tumor. Somebody said a mortality rate is a 10% or so. In such case, only TSS, only uh, open surgery, it is difficult to uh, remove the totally without complications. So we choose the combined surgery. Uh, TSS and uh, this case, uh, anterior interhemisic approach uh, did uh, simultaneously. So in this operation, we need uh, two team, but the uh, result is excellent. Uh, tumor was subtotally removed and no complication after the surgery. Uh, since 2008, uh, I tried to improve and preserve pituitary functions. In uh, this case, 44 years old man, he demonstrated a visual disturbance, but uh, also he had uh, uh, mild pituitary dysfunctions. And we checked before surgery, where is the normal ground here? And not only the visual disturbance, but we want to uh, improve the, uh, his pituitary dysfunctions. First of all, uh, I tried to find the cleavage between the normal ground and tumor here. But, and the close up view here, another membrane between the normal ground and tumor. So here is a new cleavage. I think this is a uh, should capsule. It's a non functioning adenoma. I preserved such a membrane uh, to keep the pituitary functions and only the tumor removed piece by piece. And then the surgery, uh, such membrane become uh, sick and uh, redness. It's mean uh, uh, see normal ground become rebasterized. After the operation, a uh, tumor totally removed, visual disturbance improved, and also uh, pituitary dysfunction improved uh, within the normal range after one year after the operation. After such uh, principle uh, to remove the non-functioning adenoma, uh, improvement rate uh, elevated the ritual and 
no change, it means uh, preserved absolute functions uh, also improved. Uh, and the deterioration rate, 22% uh, to the 6%, it's significantly reduced. So I think uh, in some case, absolute uh, dysfunction becomes a uh, surgical indication in non-functioning at the normal. So how about this case, 44 years old man, uh, he demonstrated the central hyperadrenalism, gonadism, thyroidism, severe GH deficiency, and DI. But he had no visual impairment. Uh, 10 years ago, he has no surgical indication. But I recommend him uh, surgery to improve uh, his pseudo dysfunctions. After the surgery, a normal gland preserved like this. And after the operation, uh, his pituitary dysfunction were improved all in the normal range. Uh, his quality of life is uh, drastically changed and he go back to his original uh, works. I think we can change his life. Uh, how about Ratoki Kreft Sift? This is 30 years old man, woman, uh, mild visual disturbance and uh, pituitary dysfunctions. Uh, some rotor crest cysts uh, often recur again. So we do some uh, different way of uh, treat the rotor crest cyst. Uh, after removal of the cyst content, uh, I insert the endoscope to the inside of the cyst cavity and irrigate it again and again using a, a little bit warm uh, shrine. Uh, so this is a rotor crest cyst case. And, uh, uh, I irrigate the inside of the cyst uh, like this using a, a hot shrine, and uh, it's meant uh, to prevent the reaccumulation. And also, uh, uh, after removal of the cyst uh, membrane, uh, such a case, I suture the membrane to the dura uh, to prevent the uh, reaccumulation. So this case. Uh, two more uh, cyst content was removed and uh, uh, dysfunction and uh, visual impairment was improved. So this is a recurrent arachnoid cyst. Uh, previous hospital, uh, two times uh, open surgery, but recurred again. Uh, TSS, is the uh, best way to solve the uh, record. Uh, it's been arachnoid membrane. We must open the uh, membrane uh, multiply. Uh, we make a multiple uh, fenestration. So uh, open the arachnoid membrane posteriorly and superiorly. Uh, this is a uh, 70 degrees endoscopic view uh, using a malleable, uh, bendable uh, instrument. Uh, open the uh, fenestration. Uh, this is a final view. And uh, uh, after the seven years, uh, no uh, recurrent. Uh, this is a cranial pharyngioma, 23 years old man. And extend uh, surgery uh, recently, it's a common uh, approach to the cranial pharyngioma. It can detect the so many anatomical structures. Now I dissect the uh, uh, cribbage from the south ventricle, hypothalamic region, and I said A was preserved. And this is a, a large tumor and uh, cuts the tumor and removed. And it cuts the stalk because the tumor uh, invade to the stalk. And this is the final view. After the operation, tumor was all removed. Uh, this case is an eight years old girl, uh, conquer type uh, cranial pharyngioma. Uh, and also uh, she demonstrated a very severe visual disturbance. So using a navigation system and the drilling system, uh, we drilled out the conquer type cellar and find the cell floor and puncture the uh, cyst. 
and remove the cyst content. And of fibrous tissue was removed. And after that, uh, cribbage between the optic knob and tumor dissected and cut. And here is a stalk. A stalk was also cut at the distal portion and attached to the uh, posterior part of the cellar, like this. And after the operation, uh, tumor totally removed and the visual disturbance improved. Uh, this case is an uh, incidental dentary find uh, cranial pharyngioma. But she only demonstrated a headache, no visual disturbance, and no pitch dysfunction. Uh, and the ideal approach to the uh, cranial pharyngioma is uh, uh, here, stroke. So uh, we choose the TSS. But this case, very narrow corridor here, only here. So uh, we drew out the privacy and the normal ground pulled down uh, to the caudal side and the make a space between the optic knob and the normal ground. First of all, uh, drilled out the cribus. And uh, this region, there is a venous plexus, so much venous breeding. So using a flow cell, control the venous breeding. And normal ground pull down like this. And uh, uh, mass reduction, uh, you first attempt. Uh, remove the tumor piece by piece. The gap between the uh, chiasma, normal ground, and stalk. And after that, uh, dissect the tumor from the surrounding structure, south ventricle, uh, hypothalamic wall, using a counter technique, and sometimes using a, some like a, a bending instrument. And the uh, stalk was preserved, all surrounding structure was preserved and totally removed. Tumor was totally removed like this. Uh, next case is a 30 years old boy, a cranial pharyngioma. Of course, uh, we choose a transfer surgery, but like this, uh, tumor uh, enlarged to the posterior part, uh, compressed the uh, brain stem. It's mean a uh, tumor uh, attached to the vaginal artery and the PCA's perforators. And like this, uh, tumor involved the uh, perforator from the PCA's. So we think. Uh, another thing to remove the tumor safely. Uh, combined surgery is uh, one of the uh, way to remove the tumor. And uh, at this time, we choose the uh, flexible endoscope assisted transfernal surgery. It's mean uh, endoscope insert via the uh, anterior form of lateral ventricle. And uh, via from a monro uh, observed uh, this region. Uh, tumor surrounding uh, check from the uh, from a mondo. This is the view from from a mondo. Cyst wall is here, and uh, uh, this is a TSS and uh, puncture the cyst wall and the mass reduction. And after that, uh, this is a, a from a mondo uh, assistant endoscope. Uh, dissect the tumor from the south ventricle. And after that, uh, tumor removed via TSS. Uh, at this time, uh, tumor wall was dissected from the uh, hypothalamic region, so easily dissect. And this is a, a tumor membrane and a sharp dissection uh, between the uh, hypothalamic region and also using a counter technique to be removed from a uh, south ventricle. And uh, this is the endoscope from, uh, from a mongo. Uh, perforator attached to the uh, tumor membrane and it involved the uh, uh, perforators. So to save surgery, we uh, preserved this region. This is the final view. Uh, he's 30 years old boy. So we suture the dura uh, watertight fashion and using a hard buttress. 
and I, uh, this case using a nasal septal flap. After the surgery, uh, here is a tumor remnant. And uh, uh, two months after the surgery, uh, we choose the cyber knife uh, to this region. Uh, after high definition type rigid endoscope, uh, TSS uh, cranial pharyngeal operation was drastically changed. Uh, before uh, high definition type endoscope introduction, uh, TSS was less than 20%. But after that, more than 60%. And the total removal rate uh, was improved 0 to 63%. Uh, near future advance. Uh, 3D endoscope. Uh, this is very good for the education. Uh, for us, uh, to tell the truth, uh, we don't need 3D endoscope because uh, we use the endoscope uh, to make uh, uh, 3D image, uh, move the endoscope uh, front or back and make a 3D image. But it's very good for the uh, young neurosurgeon and uh, uh, scrub nurse to demonstrate the operations. But a little bit uh, for me, uh, it's exhausted. Uh, ICZ endoscope, I think it's a promising tool. Uh, ICZ is originally uh, uh, to detect the vascular arteries. Uh, but uh, I think it can also be useful uh, to detect a tumor. Uh, like this, uh, this is a, a tumor, and here is a normal gland. Uh, we can detect the uh, cleavage between both uh, tissues. Uh, 4K endoscope, now uh, maybe uh, change to the 4K endoscope. Uh, for endoscope, we can use a very, very wide monitor like this. So also we can get a very close up view and we can get use a wide monitors. But now uh, we use the 4K with ICZ endoscope. Uh, we purchased it uh, uh, just this summer. Uh, this is a production uh, producing adenoma cleavage it's here. And using a ICZ, uh, we can detect the cleavage, a normal gland and the tumor are like this. Very, very clearly, uh, we can detect the cleavage. So I think it is the uh, main use of the uh, endoscopic surgery in TSS. Uh, TSS is a freehand surgery. Uh, its merit is a hand rig. Uh, we can uh, move the uh, endoscope, up, down, right, left, short, deep, rotation, rapid, uh, very, very easily and rapidly. But demerit is uh, tremor and fatigue and rest fineness. Uh, we developed uh, eye arms. This is a uh, elbow holder. Uh, this holder follow up the movement of elbows. And after stop the uh, elbow movement, it sustained the uh, elbow. It can use uh, two hand surgery like this, uh, one hand uh, holding the uh, endoscope and also uh, four hand surgery. A scoper uh, can hold the endoscope very stably and easily. Uh, this eye arms, I think, at first, I think it's not necessary. Uh, we, uh, so-called expert, uh, we can, we don't need this one. But uh, please think about uh, car, a navigation system, uh, power window, and the back monitors. Maybe 20 years ago, uh, those instruments were very luxury one. And we don't think about uh, such a uh, very, very convenient instrument. But in these days, uh, car navigation system, back monitor, power window, power string, air conditioner, all of the instrument is very useful and necessary. So I think in the near future, 
such a not necessary but uh, very very convenient instrument is change the TSS. So uh, I talk about the uh, surgical innovation of TSS in uh, instrument uh, technique and complication avoidance. And those innovations, after that, uh, surgical strategy was changed. And also surgical indication was expanded for uh, pituitary uh, surgeries. Uh, conclusion, uh, we must take into account the lessons learned from history and not neglect effort to reduce the complications. We must stop the complication. After that, we can do TSS. And surgical innovation in endoscopic TSS manipulations for pituitary tumors contribute to preservation of functions, and minimizing of safety, and expanding of surgical indication. Thank you, attention. And I'm sorry about not uh, work the uh, slide show. Thank you very much, Professor Cavallo. Thank you, Professor Romano. Really a comprehensive uh, presentation you showed uh, uh, a lot of interesting things uh, as expected, I would say. So first, um, you have uh, um, showed clearly that uh, uh, this kind of surgery required uh, adequate instruments. And this is a basic point because uh, it's uh, linked strictly to the property of the endoscope. And one of the common problem when you work with the endoscope, thanks to uh, the diverging view offered by the endoscope, is that sometimes you see some corner in the surgical field, but you are not able to reach that corner with the endoscope, with the instruments. So this is the reason why several groups around the world uh, have worked to develop proper instruments. So this is just a comment. Another one, and I fully agree with you, it's about 3D endoscope, which also in our experience is uh, uh, not, it doesn't give the expected benefit Why the 4K for sure is an, a, a big advance as compared to the HD camera. And uh, even with the ECG, you show it clearly, that's uh, really a promising uh, uh, new tool, especially for pituitary surgery. So this is just a comment. For a question, I would like to ask you about the nasal flaps. Uh, I agree that for pituitary surgery, nasal septa flap should not be raised. Pituitary surgery is a minimal invasive surgery. You yes. do not need to rise it any nasal septal flap. Even if you have large intraop CSF leak, you don't need to rise nasal septal flap. But you can use other flap to the nose. What we use uh, usually is the mucopericondrum from the middle to finish. You have just to cut one uh, middle turbinate. You can use the mucopericondrum from that turbinate, and uh, it works quite well. Also, when you have a uh, uh, large uh, intraopsis leak. So, my question for you is that if uh, you use this uh, free flap in pituitary surgery, of course, in extended approach, all of us use. Uh, nasoceptal flap, but even in extended approach, sometimes you, you can avoid to raise nasoceptal flap. Please, Professor Raman. So you mean, uh, what the case uh, I use uh, nasoceptal flap, is that right? Yes, and if yeah. you use a uh, middle turbinate flap in pituitary surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, middle turbinate uh, flap, I experienced the two or three case. That's uh, uh, so many. Uh, previous surgery, so we cannot use a nasceptor flap. And uh, I said, uh, I seldom use a, a nasceptor flap, but I use uh, only for the uh, children. And uh, uh, previous surgery, two or three times, uh, 
operation, uh, it's a uh, high risk of a CS3 gauge. So I use a nut scepter flaps. And also uh, after the operation, if the patient uh, will underwent the, some uh, uh, radiation therapy, at that time I use a uh, uh, nut scepter flap. But uh, except those cases, I routinely use uh, a sphenoid sinus mucosa flap. That's enough. But uh, uh, Dr. Eto posted the grading system uh, more than three, uh, CS3 case grade three. Uh, I routinely use uh, uh, fat from the abdomen. After that, uh, using a hard batteries and routinely use the sphenoid sinus mucosa flap. So such a case, uh, most cases, uh, I don't need a nut scepter flap. A nut scepter flap is, uh, so I think invasive. Some doctor says not invasive, but uh, my patient uh, said uh, some uh, complication, uh, you know, different feeling of nose. So I believe uh, spinal sinus mucosa is not invasive. So I recommend this uh, way of uh, uh, fraps. Okay, thank you. Another point I would like to discuss with you is about the, the use of transcranial surgery for uh, pituitary adenoma. Because mm -hmm. I saw in uh, your series that uh, uh, you have uh, a lot of uh, patients who has been operated transcranially for pituitary tumor. I imagine, especially in the past, because mm -hmm. as you show it today, with the endoscope, we raised the bar. I mean, uh, we can uh, uh, treat endoscopically uh, some pituitary tumor that uh, were in which uh, transpenadal root was a contraindicated in the past, like, uh, for example, dumbbell shaped uh, 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 pituitary adenoma, or those growing also over the anterior canal base, uh, or the giant one, or at least some of the giant one. So in our experience over the last 20 years, we had a dramatic reduction of the use of a transcranial approach for uh, pituitary uh, tumors. And uh, this is good because uh, go transcranially to remove a pituitary tumor is not always easy, like for other diseases like meningioma or craniopharyngioma, because the capsule bleed more than uh, this kind of uh, the other types of tumor. So we, we have really, really a bigger advance in using uh, the endonasal root also for a large or irregular shaded uh, pituitary adenomas through the endonasal root. What's your feeling about this? Yeah, uh, combined surgery is, I think, uh, one of the uh, way to uh, prevent the complications. Of course, we try to total removal. But the most important thing is uh, uh, to reduce the complications. So huge adenoma, uh, most uh, complication, most serious complications uh, uh, after the he uh, hemorrhage in the regional tumor. So the uh, combined approach is uh, one of the uh, way to prevent such a complication. And another uh, side is, uh, you know, uh, watch from the two side is very, very uh, safe. And uh, for the operators, very, very uh, feel at ease. So if transfer surgery, we can only see the one way to the tumor. But uh, from the uh, other view, uh, it can help us uh, another information, other information. So uh, some case, uh, there is uh, some perforator outside of the tumor and uh, uh, other case uh, attached to the uh, optic knob or uh, okra motors. Uh, such case, uh, combined surgery uh, prevent uh, complication and help us uh, so many information. So uh, if feel anxiety to the such a huge adenoma, uh, do not hesitate to use the combined surgery. Yes, this is one of the way which has been described and proposed by, by different groups to combine. Uh, and it's reasonable, especially when uh, uh, the growth of the tumor is uh, off of the range of view of the endoscope. Uh, the other point is that sometimes you can uh, 
go extra capsularly through the through the nose using extended approach uh, so that you can combine uh, infracapsular and extracapsular corridor through a single uh, through a single approach but of course as you say there are conditions in which uh, the endonasal route is not enough to have a proper control of the neurovascular structure Mm -hmm. And also, you I appreciate it because you combine in the same stage the two approach, and this mm -hmm. is reasonable because some other other uh, suggest to use uh, first the transphenoidal route and then the transcranial one. Uh, but you have to be very careful uh, in the timing of the two surgery because if you leave too much tumor transphenoidally, you risk to have a complexity of the residual tumor transcranial. To, to the residual tumor so that uh, you will have uh, a worsening of the clinical condition of the patient that you will need to operate transcranially this patient in a worse condition so it's always better to try to remove completely the tumor uh, in uh, one stage instead uh, of uh, using uh, two surgery in two different uh, uh, times so thank you thank you i really appreciate it and another point I want to discuss with you is uh, the use of transphenoidal route in uh, concal type stranded stents, which uh, I believe is absolutely uh, reasonable. It's not anymore a contraindication, a concal type stranded stents, transphenoidal mm -hmm. route, even because uh, uh, usually that bone is soft. It's quite easy to remove. You will uh, easily find. Uh, the cortical bone on the other side, you can easily drill inside. So there is no uh, reason to avoid transphenoidal root just because you have a, a concal type sphenoid science. Okay, uh, please, uh, Reja. You, Thank you. There Thank are some you. question from the, from the yes. audience. There is a question from the audience. What are your tips regarding saving the pituitary stock? Do we have any special technique? Professor Amano? Uh, what are your techniques to identify the stock and preserve it? Sorry, I'm, I'm now see the Q and the A. No, no. How, how can you preserve the pituitary stock? Uh, pituitary stock? How? Uh, most cases, uh, to tell the truth, uh, cranial pharyngioma uh, to preserve the, uh, after preserve the stock, most of the case demonstrate the diabetes in spades. So if the tumor not invaded to the uh, stalk, I preserve the stalk. But uh, most of the case tumor invaded into the stalk, at that time, I not, uh, I'm not hesitate to cut the stalk. What is the post-operative morbidity following resection of the stalk? Like, uh, do you, have you seen any increased mortality in patients in, in whom you have cut the stock and in whom you have preserved? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We cooperate with the endocrinologist. So uh, I don't, I do not hesitate to cut the stock. I mean, uh, endocrinologist uh, covered the hormonal replacement. So, uh, so that's the reason why I don't hesitate. But of course, Stoke is uh, uh, still uh, clear, not invaded by tumor. I preserve the stoke. Okay, thank you very much. Any tips from Professor Cavallo? No, I fully agree. And I would uh, also say that uh, in craniopharyngioma surgery, sometimes even if you preserve anatomically the, the pituitary stalk, uh, from a functional point of view, it will not work. So, Absolutely, when there is infiltration of the stalk, there is no reason to leave that stalk there. It's much better to remove radically the tumor within the stalk. So I fully agree. Thank you very much. Dr. Liu Bun Seng, my co-host, any yeah. questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, thanks, uh, uh, Raja. Thanks, Professor Amano. Uh, I, I have two questions for you, Professor. Uh, can, can you explain what's the basis of uh, ICG? Uh, in differentiating uh, uh, tumor and uh, normal gland uh, first. Uh, second question, Professor, uh, how do you uh, view uh, previous history of skull-based fracture and also uh, probably a previous sinus infection? Are there relatively a contraindication and what are the precautions 
whether we need uh, angiogram uh, before surgery. Thank you, Professor. Mm -hmm. Our first question, uh, please read my paper. Uh, my concept is, uh, uh, you know, ICG fluorescence time is different from each uh, tissues. Uh, very seen normal ground uh, delayed, but uh, uh, tumor uh, area than very seen normal ground. But I show you the proaction number that is. Uh, uh, normal ground is still uh, not compressed by the tumor. Such case, uh, normal ground uh, fluorescent earlier than tumor. So such a time lag I use. And the point is, uh, uh, do not use the ICG not so much. Uh, in vascular surgery, maybe they use uh, uh, 10 to 20 milligram, but uh, I use only the five or six milligram. And second question is uh, uh, trauma. Uh, yes, trauma and sinus infection. Uh, sinus infections. Yes. Uh, trauma mean uh, mm, skull base, skull base fracture. Previous history skull of base. skull base fracture. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a. Mm, I have not experienced uh, after the trauma. Yeah. How about infection, Professor? Uh, infection. infection. Yes. Previous history of Infe infection. Yes. Uh, infect you mean the you infection? Uh, uh, sinusitis. Contra yes, yes. Sinusitis. If a patient. Sinusitis. Oh, oh, yes, oh yes. yeah, 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 yeah. But sinusitis is, uh, I think, uh, not contra uh, indication. Because uh, I've opened the uh, way to the outside to the uh, make a hole and the uh, synthesis uh, getting improved. So synthesis is not so contraindication. Thank, thank you, Professor. Maybe Professor Cavallo has any experience dealing with history of fractures? But you mean a uh, uh, fracture to be said, uh, you mean cephalic from skull base fracture, how we manage uh, I don't understand what you want. Uh, no, uh, Prof. Let's say a patient come with a uh, 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 accident with a skull base fracture with mm -hmm. incidental finding of a, a pituitary adenoma. Mm -hmm. How you deal about it? Ah, you mean if you find incidental pituitary adenoma? Yeah, in, in a skull base fracture patient. And what is the link in between no, no. the fracture and yeah. uh, the yeah, I mean the accidents uh, with a skull base fracture and incidental finding of a pituitary macroadenoma. <laughs> how 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 do we manage? But if you find uh, regardless of the skull base fracture, if you find an incidental pituitary adenoma, which is uh, quite common today to find, because a lot of people do MRI or CT scan for different reason after trauma, for headache, for whatever. Uh, it depends on the type of adenoma. So if uh, the tumor is non-functioning and the visual field is normal, what we do usually is just to observe over the time what happened. And usually when you have uh, intracellular enclosed microadenoma, less than six, seven millimeter, usually they remain stable over the year. So you don't have to do nothing. You don't have to follow the disease, but, but just to check. But sometimes when you do MRI or CT scan, you find big surprise. You can find the large pituitary tumor, you can find the craniopharyngioma, Ratke or other disease. And in that case, especially if the patient are symptomatic for a visual field defect or even for a pituitary malfunction, you have to treat that. You have to discuss with the patient, and, but you have to treat that which is not easy always because, you know, they discover uh, uh, an incidental disease. They are fine, but you have to explain them that uh, th that tumor has to be removed. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. We had a very interesting session. So with that, I would like to wind this up officially. Professor Shubin is here with us, also Professor Leonidas Quintana, thank you very much for staying back, Professor Shubin. Yes, Professor Amano, thank you for, for your very uh, beautiful presentation.
and I'm thinking about the uh, next year's uh, ACNS Congress. Uh, maybe we can invite uh, Professor Amano to present it, his live case. Oh, in thank the you. Yeah. <laughs> That's I great. really want to meet you again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very great. much. Thank Professor you again. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Quintana. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much for all. Thank Excellent. You, Thank you all. Yes, I will wind this up officially now on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS. And the president, Professor Yoko Kaito, I would like to sincerely thank both the speakers of today, Professor Leonardo Quintana and Professor Kosaku Amano, as well as the chairs, Professor Shubin and Professor Luigi Maria Cavallo, for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. Thank you, my dear co host, Liu Bun Seng, for joining in today. So, until you all meet on the 25th of September, it is bye bye from everybody. Thank you very much for joining.